So our next speaker, Cass Everett of GAD, many fames. Uh, he's been at Epic, he's been at uh, NVIDIA. Where else have you been, Cass? Id. Id, of course, duh. And Oculus, currently. All right, hello everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Alon for giving me so much extra time here. We're just gonna go through my slides twice. <laughs> All right, um, in stark contrast to Alon's really pretty slides, mine are going to be um, uh, very black and white and uh, sadly um, not full of, of all of the, the kinds of cool images and everything. However, um, I think there's some in interesting things to talk about with respect to uh, Vulcan and VR. So um, a few words about myself first. Um, I've been in the computer graphics industry for a pretty long time. Uh, it doesn't seem that long until I think about it. Um, but I, I got started back in, in the early 90s and went to see my first presentation uh, about OpenGL and it, actually Kurt Akeley and, and uh, Mark Siegel and those people that, that were um, forging from IrisGL uh, into OpenGL land were doing their first presentation uh, to, to sort of the masses. And I didn't know OpenGL at that time, that was 93. But I learned it pretty quickly and uh, spent a lot of time messing around with it on SGI workstations. Um, but then over the years, I, I uh, sort of worked on OpenGL in, at NVIDIA and um, did a lot of things as we were sort of moving from fixed function functionality into uh, programmable. And then a few years ago, when it looked like virtual reality was actually going to get over the lawnmower man hump, um, which was a depressing decade or so, uh, and, and actually be something, I thought, hey, this will be a good time to go and join Oculus and, and sort of help um, forge a path forward for, for um, this technology that I think is going to, to be sort of fundamental to the way that humans and computers interact. Um, we're not there yet. The kinds of technologies that exist today illustrate that it can be done at a commodity level um, and, and you can have real experiences that are exciting and interesting for you know plausibly a couple hundred dollars over what you would pay for say um, a really nice Galaxy class uh, Samsung phone. And that's pretty cool, um, but, but moving a little bit further forward, it will need to be things that, it, it will need to be positionally tracked and it'll need to have uh, a form factor that's easy to just carry in your pocket, sort of like what happened with the advent of the internet connected smartphone. Um, so the, the virtual reality revolution had started with, um, with the existing APIs before Vulkan had, had really arrived. And so Vulkan will, will um, uh, find its way integrated in uh, to, to VR subsystems sort of as a, an aftermarket addition to the APIs. And some of what I'm gonna talk about here is about that. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll go ahead and get started with the slides. Maybe I should just do the whole talk with one you know, title slide. Um, <laughs> or, or for all you guys know, the clicker's not working and I've just been like freaking out. <laughs> So, um, so the presentation that I'm, I'm gonna give here is, is actually two presentations, but I wrote both of them and I'm to blame. Um, so the first one is a, a bit about how to bring Vulkan graphics to a, a VR-based uh, subsystem and, and what exactly that means. And, and in particular, VR is going to be a multi-graphics API um, um, sort of system for probably forever, um, and there are a lot of good reasons for that, but um, uh, understanding how to make sure that, that the APIs that we provide uh, work seamlessly with Vulkan as well as OpenGL, and, um, and to a surprising extent, uh, we, we're really interested in how they interface with, for example, web-based technologies. Um, and then as a second, second thing, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, a tool um, or a sample that a coworker of mine, Johannes van Weberen, uh, started developing uh, a, about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, and, and it, it turned out to be a really interesting exercise in how big you could make one C source file. Um, and, and the answer is pretty large. Um, but but it, it actually uh, yielded some important fruit, uh, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's worth talking about and sort of understanding how it can benefit uh, hardware developers, 
and, uh, which is sort of one of the reasons it was developed, but also it turned out to be useful for learning how to, um, how to uh, provide abstractions between Vulkan and other graphics APIs, because at the end of the day, we're, we're, ju we're, we're usually working on the same kind of GPU, um, and we have the same sort of constraints underlying how we want to render things. So what we'd like to be able to do is say, what is, what is a, a reasonably thin abstraction that works well for all these APIs? And, and uh, Johannes, uh, I call him JP, so I may uh, um, say, say that too. So JP, Johannes, I'll interchange. Um, uh, went through this exercise and has done it with OpenGL and OpenGL ES and um, Vulkan and DirectX 11 and 12. Um, and, and we're adding metal support. So when you see this sample, understand that it's sort of the tip of, of an API um, abstraction iceberg, but it's one I think that's useful uh, you know, as you're looking at how to support multiple platforms. I think it may not be the exact answer for you, but an existence proof uh, can be really beneficial. And so they're, they're all gonna go this long, so uh, it, I really am gonna use all your time, Alon. Uh, so Act One is is uh, the graphics API agnostic design of VR API. So how many people here are familiar with Gear VR? All right, I see a lot of people in the back there. So Gear VR is basically um, I work on the so software side of the Gear VR product. I work uh, on the Oculus Mobile SDK, which is the the base software uh, used in Gear VR, and the common low level API that's used by every. Uh, VR app, whether you know it or not, on, on Gear VR is the VR API. It is the fundamental uh, glue level that that every native app must use. If you use Unity or, or, or um, Unreal, then you may well not be aware that you're using it, or if you use some other framework um, or you know a web interface, you may not know that you're using VR API, but the fundamental things that are supported in the platform come from there. And it started out uh, very naturally as a GLES only kind of thing, uh, but then it uh, uh, grew over time and we realized that we needed to have, you know, to sort of generalize the support. So um, I'll, I'll start by talking about, you know, VR API started as this thing that was GLES centric um, and it, it was really an easy choice and John Carmack was, was um, the first implementer of the VR API and he called it VR API. And, um, and then the way that John will frequently do with things, he trailblazes, he gets some, you know, this proof of concept together, gets it to the point where, you know, um, it's easy for, you know, the second uh, um, wave of engineering that's, you know, you know, 10 times as broad, but, uh, you know, has to focus on all the, what does it take to make this thing ship kind of details and working through all the bugs. Um, and so uh, John Paul, or there, there's a third version for JP, Johannes, John Paul, um, where as we go along, there's going to be far too many names for him, but he is all the same guy. Um, sort of took ownership of this API and, and evolving it. And, um, and you know, what we learned was we needed some of these abstractions, some of the things that were really easy to do in the beginning, um, like completion fences, we just said, well, there's a render thread for the game to use, and when you call submit frame, you need to have the, the GLES context that you are using bound. And, you know, we can then go and create a fence at that point, and that fence is implicitly applied to whatever rendering happened in your rendering thread. Um, and that, that worked. It, it was a fine solution, um, but we realized as Vulkan was taking shape that it was not going to be a fine solution for Vulkan. And, and some of the, the things that changed in the API over time uh, were recognizing that there were these subtle differences between the APIs and things that we really actually had to pay attention to and make sure that there was a plausible way to address these things so that when you look at the VR API, you don't say, oh gosh, this is the most ridiculous way to use it for my OpenGL ES app, or hey, this doesn't even work at all for Vulkan. And of course, we definitely couldn't do the doesn't even work at all for Vulkan, so that was, that was right out. But we did want the API to be the same, because when you look at how VR APIs work, um, I think it's important to note that, uh, so uh, didn't get a lot of hands raised on the, the Gear VR question, but uh, how many people here have spent any time looking at VR APIs on any kind of platform? All right, well, I guess we can continue then. I was gonna say if nobody raised their hand, I'm leaving. Um, 
Uh, but okay, so the, the important things to note uh, about VR APIs are basically that they behave in a lot of ways like uh, a conventional window system integration layer for, um, uh, for Windows or for uh, X Windows. And, and, and what I mean by that is, is that you have this essential thing where when the app starts up, it needs to um, allocate something that it can display to, like a window, and then it needs to, when it's finished rendering uh, to that thing, it needs to pass it off to a presentation engine. And there are some extra things that come along with, with VR, uh, most notably that it must be stereo, um, otherwise, uh, things you know, um, uh, monoscopic VR can exist, but it's not the the ideal experience. Um, uh, so it must be stereo, and it is really important to know uh, a prediction, uh, a predicted um, orientation for the head at the time that you're about to start rendering. And that tends to not be as super huge a deal for monitor-based apps because the app can just kind of say, I'm starting in this position. You know, but if you do that in VR, then people are sitting at their desk facing the wrong way, and, and you sort of have to, like, they, they hate you. Um, so, so fundamentally, all we really are doing is the same thing that a, that a Windows compositor is doing, except that it's really important for us to know um, the orientation that the cameras were, the, the orientation the cameras, the orientation of the head uh, used for generating these eye buffers, and, um, and then we can fix up uh, any disparity between what we told them it was going to be and what it actually is when we go and display. And then we need to know with the images that are presented whether or not the GPU is actually finished rendering them. And so this is probably the most important synchronization detail um, that we have on the VR API side is this, this, um, this slightly more complicated interaction with the compositor that where it has to be spatially aware. Um, there's some implementation uh, specific details uh, um, that, that we have to do, um, and this is just a part of initialization uh, that, that does have to be platform aware. If you're on Windows, there will be handles. If you're on um, uh, Android, there will need to be a VM or an activity pointer or something like that. Um, and we can't really abstract away that bit uh, completely, uh, but, but it does mean that there's platform specific initialization, but it sort of rolls into the, the general thing. Um, in the same way that in Vulkan, there, there are uh, p-next pointers to, to handle the, stru um, the, the structures that are not um, platform specific, or that are platform specific. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I, I'm, if I'm not careful, I'll wind up talking about things the slide before that they show up. So, um, uh, let me make sure that I'm not um, missing anything here, but, uh, we did have this, um, unfortunately, when we started the, the VR API, it was, it was Android only, and so we had Java VM pointers and JNI NV pointers and activity objects sort of littered throughout the code. Um, and we, di we didn't actually, and haven't yet fully pulled that out completely into something that's very you know, neatly platform specific, but that's one of the things that's sort of um, in the queue to do for us. Um, and, and one of the reasons that we started moving uh, toward clearing this up early was, uh, was that uh, the Android native debugging uh, environment, so how about, how about show of hands for Android development? Okay, you guys like the debugger? It's, it's called log. Um, so, uh, so for a lot of development, um, uh, you, you actually wind up having some benefit of doing the initial development on a PC um, where you have access to a debugger uh, that's you know, easily integrated with your, your system. So, uh, so that was one of the reasons that, that we uh, wanted to support um, multiple platforms and that was just for you know, basically to ease internal development. Uh, but then also uh, as we had first party apps that were working really well and we liked, uh, it became clear it'd be nice if these would just run on PC without any you know, significant modification or platform modification. So, so we did go and add VR API support. It's not something that, that ships, uh, but we use it for our first party apps. And it, and it was sort of a, a, an early recognition that um, a well-designed portable VR API is actually a really attractive thing and it does give you, plat you know, more platforms than you would think. Um, uh, you know, with, with very little changes on the VR part of the code anyway. Having to change what kind of graphics API you used uh, 
between platforms uh, may be a little more sticky, but probably not with the engines that already do a good job of, of, um, of abstracting that away. Um, so uh, I, I think I'll leave it that we, we haven't quite eradicated all of the um, platform specific uh, pointers in our API, but we have sort of worked around them uh, so far, and the expectation is, is that as we iterate, um, uh, those things will become sort of more nicely modular and, and in the place that they should be, and it should be clear when you're doing something that's Android specific versus something that's, say, Windows specific. And if it doesn't need to be either, then that should be clear too, because you'll not have any platform specific headers included, or, or at least you won't have to. Um, the initialization uh, for uh, for VR API, uh, just to sort of see, we, we also use structs um, like Vulkan does, not quite in uh, a totally Vulkan style, but, uh, but we include a graphics API um, init parm, and it's an enumeration that, that for example, uh, the common uh, enumeration, and this is, we have a little helper function that does the initialization of uh, the default initialization uh, for what we think most apps will want, and, and OpenGL ES2 is sort of our default, although probably that should be at least three now, um, since most of our platforms are, are three capable, or all of them. Um, so the API choice at initialization uh, makes sense, um, but there, there are also, it's worth noting that um, if you did need to change between major APIs, you would have to do sort of a full VR teardown. Uh, I'm not sure if that would present um, problems for anybody, but since we haven't had uh, examples that, that fit that, uh, that description, um, even though we could, we could make up a use case like that, it, it doesn't exist for us today, and so we don't worry about it. It'd be good to know if, if other people feel like changing graphics API is a big deal. Uh, within a single execution session. Um, and there are other things that happen during an initialization too. Uh, the big one is negotiating uh, the, the VR API uh, version. So the application, when it's compiled for us, uh, has a static library. Um, that static library is uh, basically uh, analogous to the, the Vulkan loader in the sense that it knows about the version uh, that, that existed when you went and downloaded the SDK, but then we have a dynamic um, loading portion of that, a dynamic linking portion of, of that, which goes and gets the driver implementation um, uh, from another APK. And for us, that's really important for forward compatibility reasons because app developers may never update their APK, APK and we know for sure that new hardware is gonna come out and uh, we wanna make sure that, that people aren't penalized for, for having new hardware, that's a good thing. Um, so we do that initialization and we make sure to handle the case where, um, the, the common case would be where the old app doesn't, uh, um, is no, uh, sorry, the, 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 the natural case would be where you have an app that's never ever updated and eventually falls off the end of, of how much backwards compatibility we support, which right now is way, way back, so, um, so it's nothing to worry about. The opposite case where the application is way, way newer than the, the current VR API, shipping VR API implementation is really unusual too because you shouldn't have access to that SDK. Um, mostly that, that's available only to people inside um, Oculus. So, so if, if, if you have that happen, that'll be interesting. You should let us know. Um, so swap chains, uh, again, uh, early in, in the, the uh, talk, I, I mentioned that swap chains um, uh, or, or that the VR API behaves in, in uh, a lot of ways like a window system integration layer. And I think of it sort of as being a VR system integration layer um, in that the main things that you do with the VR API are, um, are centered around allocating images to present, um, making sure you know what orientation to synthesize those images uh, in, and, um, and then, uh, you know, actually presenting them uh, and, and tearing them down afterwards. But, but those are the things that you need. And so um, in order to be API independent, uh, swap chains exist as an opaque type for us. And you go and use these functions, um, VR API create swap chain two, texture swap chain two, um, with these parameters and you can destroy them and get the handle of the texture from them. And uh, the nice thing about having these opaque types that, that uh, the VR API 
uh, fulfills for you when you request it is that um, the, the API itself handles allocating in whatever API you initialized it with, um, but an important thing about uh, giving us control of allocation of the swap chains is sort of the same reason that, um, that in the WSI side of things, um, the, the window system integration layer wants to be able to, to control the allocation. And that's because presentation engines may well need very specific types of allocations. They may cross process boundaries. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be complicated about uh, presentable images. And so we keep that information on uh, the, the sort of window system or VR system side of that barrier because it in almost uh, um, inevitably will involve system specific details. But we can do it for you because we know what API you're using and we'll use the same kind of API to make sure that we can get you back a handle to the kind of textures that you need to create your own FBOs um, or frame buffers. Okay. Um, and another uh, point here to be made is, is that uh, the previous example, or the previous get, get texture handle, let me see what it was called again, uh, get texture swap chain handle, that's, uh, that's a, a good tell that we don't actually have full API portability in this, um, this API because it assumes that an int is perfectly adequate for, for um, returning uh, a texture handle, which in Vulkan, of course, it's not. So, um, so we've, we've um, fa fallen down on, on, you know, we can support two kinds of OpenGL, but it's just OpenGL. Uh, and, and so there will need to be an API um, update for us to, to bring, um, to bring uh, swap chain support uh, that, that also include, that, that's fully um, uh, API independent. So the other thing that we need, and this is sort of an interesting thing um, it exists in Vulkan in the WSI side of things, but, it, but it, uh, it's also important for, um, for VR. And that's when you submit uh, new frames of data with, with our VR API, uh, you, you pass in uh, the information that tells us which image you're talking about, or images, because you need a left and a right. Um, and then you have to pass a fence in. And um, unlike with, say, a monitor-based um, system, it's, it's important in a monitor-based system for the, um, for the compositor to know when the, the frame is ready, right? Um, you, you submit a whole bunch of frames to render to a buffer, and you, as far as you're concerned on the app side, you're done. You've, you've submitted it, but the thing is is that you don't know exactly when all that rendering will be finished and when pixels can actually start coming out uh, of the display. In VR, we care a lot more about that than, than you would normally in conventional monitor-based rendering. Um, and so, so we require a fence to be passed in. Uh, one other thing that I guess I can note about this is, is that a, com a traditional compositor um, can also make use of a semaphore um, in Vulkan. To, to sort of have, here's the semaphore that says uh, stall scanning this buffer out until the semaphore is actually um, uh, signaled. In, in VR, composition actually is another graphics task today. Um, and that's because there's a fair amount of complexity involved in, um, in the, the uh, distortion correction that comes from the lenses and in adjusting or reprojecting those, um, those eye buffers based on um, a, less, uh, a less erroneous prediction of the head's orientation. And so in order to do that rendering, we first need to know whether or not the images are complete on the CPU. And so we use a, a CPU fence to, to check that and, and we get the newest ones available. And then at that point, when we're ready to submit the rendering, we go and check what's the latest version of um, or what's the latest prediction of the head pose? And the thing is, is that when you're when the app is doing the rendering, uh, it's going to be doing the rendering up to you know uh, 30 milliseconds before um, photons start coming out of the pixels. When we uh, are in the compositor, we're about um, eight milliseconds ahead, and so the prediction will be a little bit better at that point. The, the prediction data is updating continuously approximately every one to two milliseconds, and so the closer you can get to um, the time that you actually need it, the better the prediction is going to be. So at eight milliseconds out for Gear VR, we do uh, a check to see 
what the predicted head orientation is, and then we adjust the rotation um, based on where, where the, the, the images, uh, where the virtual camera um, synthesized the images and where the head really is. And it's not a big adjustment, but it's enough. If you don't do it, it the things don't feel like they're stuck properly in the real world. Um, anyway, uh, so in VR API, we sort of realized as we went down this path um, that uh, we needed, just like we needed the, the API to do the allocation of presentable images, we also needed it to do the allocation of the fences. Um, uh, and, and so uh, what, what we have today in, um, in VR API will allow you to not send a fence at all, but if you do that, you're implicitly uh, um, entering the contract that says you uh, have added this thing uh, or you're, you've called submit frame with the context current that you can then create a fence, that, that we can create the fence for you. But that's not portable for a lot of reasons. One uh, maybe big reason is that we allow multiple layers in the compositor today. So if you've seen VR cinema where you're watching a movie or you've seen Netflix in VR, there's the world that's rendered, but then there's also the TV screen, and those are separate things, and they could be potentially rendered by separate contexts or, in the Vulcan parlance, separate cues. And we don't have a good way of um, inserting those fences into the appropriate cues, so we sort of had to switch to a model where, A, we allocate the fences for you, but B, we need you to insert them into the, the appropriate cue so that we know completion really means completion, uh, and we can't do it implicitly with this, this notion that um, we, we trust you to call us with the right context current. Um, and you could only call us with one context current in submit frame anyway. So, so it wound up being uh, sort of a big uh, lessons learned mess, and it works fine for us right now, but basically it imposes some, some unnecessary restrictions um, on, on even the current API, but it's not forward compatible to Vulkan, so that'll, that'll change. Um, in new versions of VR API. All right, and so I, I just I think I've described what uh, what the compositor looks like, but this is a little um, a shorter little description uh, graphical, and don't get used to it. This is the only picture, um, except for some screenshots that uh, uh, that we'll look at later. Um, but the basic idea with the VR compositor is, is the application um, starts at some time. Uh, uh, and the PL0 is, um, is the prediction at some latency uh, for time zero, which again is maybe 30 milliseconds um, uh, before the frame is displayed. And it synthesizes these two buffers, left and right. And then at the end of synthesis, or at least at the end of submitting all the commands to synthesize those buffers, it calls a submit frame. And the submit frame then uh, passes it over into compositor land. And compositor, uh, uh, and if you've heard the term asynchronous time warp, basically this display synchronous bit uh, here uh, at the right side of the diagram is uh, an important magical part of how VR works. And it's essentially, once we get the images, we are very, very um, um, tied to uh, a synchronous op to synchronous operation with the display subsystem. We know when vSyncs are happening. We make sure that, um, that we issue the latest, uh, the, the commands to display these warped buffers uh, at the last possible millisecond. Um, and then when we draw, we draw uh, the left and right eyes, but we draw them with the distortion correction in them. Um, and the reduced latency in the PL1 is the important part about making sure that you've adjusted for, um, uh, for differences between the bad prediction at PL0 and the better prediction at PL1. Um, and the other thing to note here is, is that if the application misses a frame, which will happen, um, the compositor uses the old frame and the correction is usually slightly greater, but you don't get the artifact of the world moving or, or juddering around. You get the artifact that maybe the animating things within the world are slower than they should be. Um, and that's a better kind of artifact than the world moving. Okay. So I think I've already talked about this. So I'm going to skip this slide. Everybody okay with that? It's got a lot of words on it. I'm sure it's good. Um, so I, I mean, honestly, I think, I think I basically have said everything about uh, asynchronous time warp. Um, and, uh, and 
I think everybody knows what the eye buffers are, right? They're the, the synthesized um, uh, per eye view thing. Okay, I feel like I've, all right, I just completely, uh, completely uh, should have put this in a different slide. Could have talked about it. Um, so the compositor has this, uh, so one of the things that we wanna be careful to do uh, with, with the VR API design is to, to understand how different implementations may have uh, significantly different uh, designs. And uh, even when you look at PC and uh, mobile today, the, the, we have a fairly radically different design. But the, the design that we use in mobile today actually runs more, more like conventional uh, middleware, third-party software. You link it in, and when you make a call, we're running just as your process and doing things that uh, if you knew uh, exactly how to make them work, you're, the, the commands that are being issued are the same commands. Um, uh, that we issue the same kind of commands that you do. Um, that's, that was expedient for the initial phases of, of Gear VR, and it still works great, and it actually has some nice properties. However, um, in the long term, the, the PC way of doing things, uh, the way that the Rift does it, is more of uh, a, a, a process. There's a separate process that does composition. That process um, manages um, getting buffers from the, uh, from the application and, and it doesn't matter especially who owns those buffers um, if, if you discount things like security concerns um, or, or what's needed for, for uh, memory to cross process um, boundaries. But, but because we wanna support both ways, it's, it's sort of incumbent on the API driver side to, to do the allocation. And so in, in PC land, we have that separate, everything runs in separate processes and synchronization works. Um, uh, synchronization can be a little bit more complicated, uh, but you have less visibility into what's going on because basically you've done this more conventional thing, which is provide a buffer of memory and a synchronization primitive to another process. And that process could be system privileged, it could have access to things that's not exposed in any API, um, and, and probably that will be the way things go in the long term, um, uh, just because uh, the system is for a lot of these things like managing process priority or queue priority um, is sort of the right thing to do. Um, I, I think I've probably hit on all of the, all the things I wanted to say there. Uh, and this is uh, then to, to recap just part one. It feels like a really, really long history lesson, I know. Um, uh, VR relies on some kind of image synthesis and some kind of mechanism uh, to, to know when it's ready to use, when it's safe to use that image. Um, and then s while system level implementations like in process or out of process can affect the API design, they're not central uh, in the sense that you don't look at the API and say, oh, this is uh, very much because I'm, you know, uh, these, these details are system specific. Um, I don't think that they may encumber the API particularly, uh, but, but they are important to, to, to understand that things like having the fences and images allocated by, uh, by the, the VR runtime are in an effort to support a wide variety of, of implementations um, and types of hardware. Uh, so with that, I'll move to the, uh, the, the Act 2, unless maybe it would be good to do questions on Act 1 uh, now and and because this is a completely separate set of uh, a separate kind of discussion. So if anybody has uh, questions or comments about uh, the VR system integration layer uh, and how Vulkan works within it, I'm kind of kind of hearing crickets. Okay. So we're so we're still currently. So the question was, uh, is there is there actually a VR API that works with Vulkan today? And the answer is, uh, no, not today. Uh, but we are working on it, and it's uh, it's something that's that's very important. Obviously, um, I will note that um, in in some ways it can be uh, useful to to uh, take shortcuts. For example, 
with uh, VR support on Android, it might well be uh, a, a, a nice shortcut choice to go and take a regular Vulkan app that, run, that would run just on your screen and then use the buffer queue sort of hooking mechanism that the Android compositor uses to, to uh, get the frames and display them. And for apps that don't use um, complex uh, elements of the VR API, like multiple layers um, and things like that, that actually might not be a terrible way to get things out there. Um, but it isn't the way that we would want to do it in the long term. Uh, but it's worth noting that, that um, Sometimes it can be simple to just go and hook an existing API because like if you think about how Android works, um, the fundamental uh, mechanism of communicating with the compositor is just images and, um, and some sort of synchronization. Uh, and sometimes the synchronization is not quite as formal as we would like, but it worked for monitors. Um, so short answer, uh, we're working on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's it, we can, we can move on. Okay. So um, the, the second part that I want to talk about is, um, is a, a little bit about what happens when you have unusual requirements. Uh, and VR has unusual requirements um, to, to express to hardware developers. And um, in this context, I think it, it, as the development of Vulkan sort of was happening, uh, Oculus felt it was important to be involved because if we got to the end of the process and Vulcan had some fatal missing component that was needed for VR, that would really stink. Um, and I should say, especially with a focus on mobile, we really, really care about Vulcan because it can and does uh, reduce the power consumption for equivalent graphics. And for us, that's a big deal. That's the difference between um, an unpleasant experience and an awesome one. Um, and and uh, it might be the difference between both pleasant experiences and one just doesn't make your phone overheat. So these are all really important things for us in, in uh, VR land and why we felt it was important to, to be there for the full you know, development process with Vulcan. Um, but it can be difficult to communicate the things that you need, especially if those things are time and latency sensitive. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we hit on early was having uh, samples that would exercise code paths that were essential uh, for VR and have them uh, easy for, for hardware vendors to go and just compile this, this sample and run it and make sure it A, compiled, B, ran correctly, and then C, did it with the right level of performance. And we try to be really clear about what the right level of performance is actually in the rendering of the, the sample. Um, and uh, the link to, to the sample I'm talking about is it's just, sh it ships in the Vulkan samples repository uh, out on GitHub. So if you want to take a look at it, it is, um, uh, it can be daunting. Um, it's, a, it's a big file and it covers all platforms um, and uh, everything, like it, there, it doesn't link to anything outside of itself. Uh, which is pretty impressive, so it's fully standalone, um, and it's written in C, not C++. So, um, and so uh, I've done it again. Um, I, I said everything I wanted to say on the previous slide, so, so um, I, I, th I think I, uh, I'll skip this, um, uh, but you know, next time you guys stop me. Um, so, uh, just like a lot of things at, at Oculus, especially Oculus Mobile, um, uh, Johannes Van Waveren wrote uh, a bunch of this. He, he basically owned it. He started and realized, hey, you know, we have this problem. Let's go down this path and see if this can be a mechanism to sort of help communicate the things that we need. And then um, very much in his standard fashion, did it and did it until the point at which you, you think maybe we should stop him. Um, but it really turned out to be uh, an awesome tool for us, a, a really helpful for, um, for codifying in a way that we could communicate to everybody. There was nothing secret about the code. The code used public APIs and it illustrates um, basically what we need to do in a succinct, and I, I, maybe I should hesitate before I say succinct, but, uh, but it really was in as standalone a fashion as possible, but, but as close to what we really do as possible. Um, and so 
we started with OpenGL ES, but the natural thing as we were trying to figure out whether or not Vulkan had everything we needed was to, to write the equivalent version of it for, for Vulkan. And that forces you to go down the path of saying, hey, how does this exact same app need to look in Vulkan? And, um, and then in D3D and in Metal. Um, and how do you make it work on Wayland and on XCB, BC, CB? You know what I'm talking about, right? Maybe there are two people in the room that know what I'm talking about. But, but on all of the windowing systems uh, of, of the various platforms. And so pushing uh, through that, uh, I think, turned out to be really useful. Um, and, uh, and I was glad to see that we got it put into the Vulcan samples because while it's dubious as a hello world kind of example, it actually is really useful to have it out there where anybody that wants to look at it can, can see it and it's educational even if it's more than most people want. Um, so uh, I, think, I think I'll uh, add here that, that the, you know, the, the idea of having the same app that looks the same um, on, on multiple graphics APIs, uh, the, the act of keeping that together over making changes and everything uh, required being pretty uh, consistent in the abstractions being used up to the point where it was basically the same file with the same structured um, declarations. Not the same structured contents, but the same structure, structured de declarations for everything. Um, and then varying as little as you could avoid for, um, for the contents of those structures, but necessarily there will be some differences. Um, and so the, the, the nice side effect of doing that is, is that you have to think about what, is, what does it mean to have a texture object in Vulkan, and what does it mean to have a texture object in OpenGL, and to sort of have, have written down in two places the stuff you need, the corresponding data structures that exist on the app side for those things. So um, I think that that's maybe one of the most useful sort of general things that, that the ATW sample contributes, even though it was never really intended to do that thing. It was just a maintenance uh, simplifier to do it. Um, and so what, this, what the samples do, and I've talked a, a bit about the samples, but what they do is they model the app plus compositor in a single application and a single source file. And they do it for every platform in this same file. Um, and so it is a big, giant piece of code. Um, and there's some if defs in it to keep you from executing Android stuff when you're on Windows, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but the nice thing is, is if you're looking for the definition of a, of a structure, it's there. You can just search in the same file. You'll find it. Uh, you may find a few instances of it if, there, if, they, if it had to be different per, um, per platform. But it's pretty quick to see uh, what it is on each. Um, the compositor part, when, when, you're doing, when you're doing VR, the compositor part, we couldn't easily do multiple processes in this sample, but we could do multiple threads. And, um, and the compositor part runs in a separate thread, ideally with a higher priority. So one of the things I've mentioned before about the, the um, compositor being display synchronous means that it really can't get um, um, jammed up behind application rendering. Application rendering should take most of the time, but when the, process, when the compositor needs to run, it really needs to run right then because it's waited until the last possible minute to get the best possible prediction and then it does all that stuff and it says, okay, uh, run me right now. And so uh, the way that we do this in the ATW samples is that the, the queue in Vulkan that gets uh, created has a higher priority than the application rendering queue. And um, on, on GLES, it's done with application, um, uh, sorry, with, with context priority, which is a, an imagination technologies extension that, that turned out to be really handy to have out there. Um, our compositor in this sample doesn't support multiple layers, but there's a good chance that it will in the future because um, increasingly we see that as an important element of, um, of sort of rich uh, VR applications. So again, things like where you have um, a virtual world and a TV screen in it. Um, if the content that's on the TV screen is uh, copy protected, uh, we can composite that in separate from the world. We can update the world less frequently than the screen. There are a number of things like that where those interactions are actually really useful and important. And probably the biggest is that the contents of the TV screen um, can be higher quality than the contents of the world. 
uh, again, another important thing. You don't want to you don't want to lose quality of the TV screen because you had to render it into a, an eye buffer. You want to just sample it at its native resolution uh, directly to pixels on the screen. Um, so uh, the thing, though, that 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 this app does that I think is important for hardware vendors is that it is scalable on a number of axes, and uh, and this allows uh, an app, a, a hardware developer or or a driver developer uh, for a GPU company to go and tweak these knobs all the way up to 11, uh, make sure that things don't start to break down. I mean, and they will break down at some point because there's only a finite amount of, of time uh, or resources to, to plow through the the rendering that happens. But we want to know, you know, at what point d does the rendering break down at a 4K by 4K screen size, or does it break down at some, you know, modest, maybe too low screen size, or how many um, unique draw calls can we do per, uh, per frame before we start missing the frame rate. But we simulate this real environment, this, this real workload that a, that a VR application would do, um, and, uh, and then we uh, uh, draw sort of a little informational graph um, that says how we're doing with respect to time, so you can run it and sort of look. And so all those things I think are really attractive for hardware vendors, um, uh, and it's useful for other people to know because these are these are things that you would need to be aware of as a VR developer. Uh, you have to always be cognizant of staying within your your time window. Um, while it's true for regular uh, um, interactive 3D graphics, it is more so. It, it is. Uh, even more true for VR. It's better to make frame rate um, uh, all the time in VR. It's it's not possible to make frame rate all the time, uh, but you'll you'll have a less than pleasant experience if you don't try um, and don't design around around making frame time. More important to make frame time than than uh, achieve a higher quality. Um, so. Uh, there are a lot of ways to, to sort of let people know how things are working, and so a driver vendor looking at, at this this um, ATW sample may well just want to look at the the log cat at the end or the, the logged messages at the end because they'll say this you know they'll provide some statistics about frames that that uh, that tore and uh, where you went over your allotment of of um, image synthesis time, um, and uh, uh, but but the big one is is at least for interactive use, is the ticker tapes that we have down here on the bottom that illustrate how much time was spent using um, d doing the actual eye buffer synthesis. So, so a quick um, a rundown of what's what's going on here. Um, there's ticker tapes at the bottom that just uh, are are used to illustrate how graphics are are doing, um, how various things are doing in terms of time. And then the main thing is is that you have two um, a left and a right buffer. And they get warped onto the screen. This is with sort of a conventional. It's not intended to be any particular distortion curve, um, but it's but it's modeled after you know ones that you might see in in conventional, highly mag, uh, highly magnified uh, lenses in in today's um, head-mounted displays. So um, so the top is the is what's being drawn by the application, and this sort of wobbles around and rotates and stuff. And then on the bottom, uh, you can sort of see how much of the time uh, is being spent on the frame. And so here, it looks like 90-ish percent of the of the frame time uh, is being consumed by synthesizing those eye buffers. And then the next the next block over tells you uh, whether or not the um, compositor finished in time. And so you want to see all green there. You, there's a little red. And that, that just means that uh, we missed a frame and there would have been a visible tear to the user, um, or at least it could have been visible to the user, depending on where it happened on the screen and how much, how much dynamic motion there was going on. And then uh, a couple of more uh, charts here that sort of show how much time was being spent in, in application rendering versus the uh, time warp, um, which is to say the compositor versus the actual drawing of the graphs, which uh, if, you, if you look at those, um, you, you'll kind of see. Anyway, um, I don't want to like go into huge detail on these. The source code illustrates what, what they all are. But um, the, point, the point being, the things, the axes that you can change things on are number of, of things being rendered. So this, this is how you sort of simulate um, 
uh, more draw calls, and, and you can do a whole bunch of them. It's not a particularly interesting thing, but the uh, GPU driver doesn't know that, and it will have to spend time uh, as, if, as if these were all actually um, precious snowflakes. Um, if, if it turns out that cubes aren't uh, what you're looking for, uh, there's also the option to do tori, and you can do more tori um, in the same way. Um, and, that, and these uh, give you extra geometry, they give you um, uh, more draw calls, um, and sometimes they're instanced, and you can sort of see the difference between instanced versus not instanced um, uh, primitives. But, um, and I, actually I, I should state, I'm not positive that, that, uh, that any of this is done instanced because the real goal with drawing more things is to show the cost per draw um, overhead. Uh, I think you could add instancing in, but, it, but our, our objective here wasn't to show you how, how much better instancing is, it was to show you what the cost of having um, precious snowflakes that were each individual uh, was gonna cost you. And then uh, similarly, we have a mechanism to ramp up the fragment shader cost so you can see what is it, what's it really cost um, if you go and uh, render with a thousand point light shading. I mean, there's no shadowing going on. And, and this isn't intended to look pretty, but it's different enough that you can, uh, that you can surmise this is the expensive fragment shader. Um, and you can apply that expensive fragment shader to um, cubes or to tori. Um, anyway, the main point here is that as you push through, the objective is to, to be able to tweak, um, to make things go between very, very cheap to very, very expensive and to understand how that affects the driver's ability to um, fulfill the contract of, you know, don't screw up the compositor. And ultimately, that's the only thing that we, that we really insist on in VR is that the compositor must uh, be able to run and it must be able to give you the best uh, um, picture it can with the most recently completed image or pair of images I should say. Um, so anyway, I, I encourage you to take a look at this, at this example. Um, it's not complicated, but the reason that I think it's worth looking at is this notion of sort of having a Rosetta Stone application that illustrates how to do some relatively straightforward um, uh, rendering in multiple APIs, and uh, uh, so all of the ATW samples have breakdowns that include things like driver instance, um, uh, GPU Q info, uh, GPU device, context, buffer, texture, geometry. Um, uh, I can read the list, or you can. I'm just gonna leave the rest of it to you. Or Michael could come up here and read the rest of them for us. Um, so, uh, uh, just uh, for, for um, I don't want to go into great detail on it, but I do want to sort of show a couple of examples uh, and, and sort of see how they look between different graphics APIs. Am I about to get kicked off? Am I? I'm, am I? Okay. Okay. If, if when the beer comes, everybody leaves, um, I won't be offended because I'm a big fan of beer too. But it may come a little early, and I think it should come a little early. Um, so uh, um, I, I think uh, hitting on a, a few points here, uh, the, the main idea is, is that if you've ever done app porting to multiple um, uh, APIs, it is really nice when you've spent some time on the abstraction. Um, and if you get the abstraction right, it can be quite elegant to handle multiple APIs. And um, I'm not saying this abstraction is the best abstraction, I'm just saying it's an abstraction that exists. And time was spent thinking about it, so it can be useful. If you, if you mostly do engine development, I wouldn't, you know, you can, you can go ahead and knock off early. But, um, but it is, I think, useful to sort of look at some of these things and to see how they, um, how they differ from, between Vulkan and OpenGL. Uh, when, when we publish the D3D uh, 11 and 12 versions, um, and the metal versions, it'll be useful if you ever want to go and say, hey, what's the, what's the equivalent of a driver instance? Um, so this is a driver instance uh, um, between Vulkan and OpenGL, and OpenGL only has a dummy because there isn't any concept of a, a driver instance in, um, in OpenGL. And um, not to belabor the point, but, uh, um, you know, that's part of the thing when you're trying to provide an abstraction. It, it was 
it was more convenient for the code being written for there to be a dummy struct that did exist than to have to code around its, its absence. So, and, and the Vulkan side, I know it looks like it's uh, complicated and messy, but all those are actually function pointers. Um, almost all those are function pointers, uh, if you could read that. And you'll be able to read it in the PDF, I, I feel confident. Um, and, and it's because uh, within the context of a driver instance, you may need to have use uh, the, the pointers that you've acquired instead of calling through um, uh, somewhere else. And, and I think almost all of these are extension uh, uh, pointer uh, uh, declarations. But then if you look at something like texture, I think texture looks a lot more like you would expect to see um, uh, because you're gonna wanna know width, height, depth, layer count, um, sample count, uh, usage, and a number of these things that aren't uh, easily represented by integers are then also represented by sort of a generic um, uh, uh, abstracted structure. So like uh, GPU texture filter is an enum that happens to, you know, this KS GPU texture filter is an enum that works uh, for either API. And that's just an illustration that it's a property that that's a property of the hardware and exposed in, in all the APIs. So, um, and then down at the bottom uh, of this, you can see um, things that aren't visible in the OpenGL um, uh, struct, like uh, needing to know layout and needing to know memory. Uh, those things don't exist. You basically get uh, target format and, uh, and a, a texture handle. So, um, so like if you wanted to go and do a side-by-side -side comparison within your own software, this is a quick thing that you can go and look at and say, oh, hey, this is, you know, why does he have that in there? And the answer may actually be useful to you at some point. Um, and so if you, if you don't have something that exists in one of these, it's at least maybe an interesting question, why not? Uh, same kind of thing here for, uh, for programs. Um, and, uh, and the program handling is completely different, but the use of these structures is actually, um, it's sort of used in the same place even in OpenGL versus uh, Vulkan. And so understanding uh, what components you need in order to, to, um, to render something with a shader on, on Vulkan, you would need to go and use this um, and apply it to a command buffer, whereas in GL it would just be part of the command stream. Um, and actually the, the graphics command uh, has an abstraction it doesn't really exist in OpenGL, but these abstractions, because they exist in Vulkan, are attractive to, to sort of have a, an equivalent version of them in OpenGL to make the rendering uh, sort of feel consistent. Um, and so I think the, the, the major point here is, is that having a side-by-side -side comparison is really useful. Uh, you could take issue with whether or not the, the abstractions themselves are the ones you would have chosen, but it's nice to have something of a starting point rather than, uh, than having to um, you know, having some sort of vague mapping your, in your head that they, there, there must be some equivalence or some, some grouping subset that makes sense. And, and this does, I think, a good job of pushing down that direction and, and saying, here's, here's a good grouping uh, that we used for a simple use case. Um, but we used only the amount of grouping of, of things that we needed to make this sample make sense. So hopefully it's instructive and provides a first derivative, you know, kind of direction to go in. Uh, but don't think of it as something that's intended to be, you know, take this code and copy paste it into your own. It's, it's more uh, as an exemplar. Um, and then my, my two sentence uh, summary to, to end my two part, my two act uh, presentation is just that VR APIs don't really need to be um, uh, tightly bound to graphics APIs and I think that's a good thing. Um, and then you should take a look at the ATW sample code uh, out in the Vulkan samples repository. Uh, it's useful on multiple levels, uh, both for hardware vendors and for, for uh, developers. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, um, we'll take uh, bets on whether there are any questions. I think I'm gonna win. Alan, do you have anything? <laughs> Alan is making fun of the fact that I drink uh, um, uh, sour beer, so. But it's not vinegar. It has a little vinegar in it. Okay, any, any uh, germane questions? All right, if not, I will hand it back over to Tom.